All right. Um, hey, everybody. We're going to get started in just a minute, um, but I wanted to say hello. My name is Virginia. I am one of the staff members over at Broadreach HQ that helps plan all of our awesome programs. We have Lindsay with us today, uh, who is one of our stellar shark biologists, um, and she's going to share a lot of really cool stuff with us today. Just wanted to remind you all to keep your mute your mics muted uh, during the presentation uh, so that uh, we don't all start talking over each other. Um, when there's a bunch of us in here, it can get kind of crazy. So if you have questions, that's awesome. Throw them in the chat box. Lindsay will get to them if she can while she's talking. And if she misses any or something like that, um, I'll save them to my computer and then we'll kind of circle back and have some time for extra questions at the end. Um, I'm also recording today's session. So if you have any friends that couldn't make it um, and you want to share it with them later uh, or you want to just rewatch how fun this is, uh, then it'll go out in the um, newsletter on Monday. Uh, and if you don't get that newsletter, I'll also share a link with you so that you can get all logged in. But Lindsay, thanks for doing with this with us today. We're excited you're here. Yeah, you're very welcome. So can I start? Wait, is it past five minutes past? Yeah, okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I hope you guys all had a fun and safe 4th of July weekend, but now it's time for something even better. And personally, I know I'm a little biased, but the best way to kick off the week would be talking about sharks. And what's really cool is that there's actually two shark talks this week. Um, on Thursday, July 9th at 1 p.m., we are continuing our shark week. And you have Elena talking about super cool, lesser known sharks. So I highly recommend that you continue learning all about sharks this week and you join us Thursday at 1 p.m. Um, what could be more important, by the way? So today I'm going to shine our broad reach spotlight on sharks that are a little bit lesser known than their flashy great white and bull shark relatives. And I picked those sharks because those are my favorites. But partly they're a little unknown because they look a little strange, which I'm sure you've picked up from looking at some of these photos on this front page. Um, or they live in the deep dark depths of the ocean. So they're rarely seen by humans. So it's a little hard to focus on them or bring them to light. Um, or simply they're unknown because there's over 500 different species of sharks, so it's hard to get to know them all, which is why we're doing our talk today. So whatever the reason, they are part of our talk today because they're very weird and that also makes them very awesome. So to start off, we are going to go back in time. Woo. There we go. Okay, so the thing is overall, before we really get into this, almost all sharks, all of those 500 plus species are very weird or special in one way or another from having extendable jaws to a dentist nightmare of hundreds of teeth to even having a sixth sense um, called electroception. So sharks have inhabited Earth's oceans for over 450 million years, which allows a lot of time for evolution to work its very slow magic. Um, and hopefully you guys watched Mary's presentation from last week to learn all about evolution. And if you didn't, I recommend that you go back on the Broadreach YouTube channel. It should be there this week, I think, um, and watch it. So the earliest fossil evidence for sharks or the ancestors to what we know as modern day sharks dates back to 450 million years ago during the late Ordovician period. Yeah, Ordovician period. I might be saying that wrong, but that's okay. Uh, before there were even fossil records for plants. So that is an incredibly long time ago. And since sharks are made out of cartilage, not bone like other fish or like we are, um, the fossil record is made up of things like teeth and spines instead of skeletons. So some of the most bizarre looking ancient sharks were found during the Carboniferous period, which is 359 million years ago. And this was right after a mass extinction event where over 75% of all species on Earth were wiped out. So because all of those species were wiped out, it really allowed sharks to dominate the oceans and give rise to a whole variety of shapes and forms. 
Um, and some of the weirdest prehistoric looking sharks appear during this period. Um, you've got the Stethocanthus, which you can see to the right hand side. That is the one that has the anvil looking thing for a dorsal fin. And what's really interesting is that paleontologists still actually don't know what that was for. Um, so I like to say it was for like a landing zone for other fish, kind of like an airplane or something like that. Um, no clue what it was actually for, but that's the great thing about these fossils is that no one really knows. They aren't here to show us or tell us. And the one that we are going to start with today is my personal favorite from that time period. It is the Helicoprion or buzz saw shark. You can see some images of it in the picture right in the middle and then on some pictures on the side. And it was the most closely related to a relative of the shark, uh, which is called a ratfish or a chimera, but we're still going to include it in our weird, wonderful thing to learn about sharks. Look at that, it's beautiful. So like I mentioned before, scientists who study ancient sharks have limited fossil records to be working from. And in the case of the Helicoprion, there was just these world fossils, which you can see on the left-hand side. And they look a little bit more like a Nautilus than anything related to a shark. If you found those fossils, you would not immediately think shark, I would think pretty shell or something along those lines. Um, and Russian geologist Alex Karpinsky realized that this fossil was actually formed from petrified parts of a shark-like fish, not from a nautilus. But the thing is, is that he had no clue where this toothy spiral belonged on the shark. So what you can see in the middle picture would be a kind of hypotheses from different paleontologists of where that whorl made out of teeth belonged on a shark's. Um, and paleontologists from all over the world debated where the display was found on the shark, and some said it was located on top of the head, which would be very cool looking. Um, others said it was on the tail or the dorsal fin, and most popularly, uh, lots of scientists were saying that it was kind of an extension of the lower jaw. And that's how you're going to regularly see it depicted in most images, because up until recently, that's thought uh, where it existed. However, over 100 years of detective work has shown that the toothy whorl actually was located in the bottom jaw of the shark. And those are the pictures all the way to the right. And what's even stranger is that it didn't have any upper teeth at all. All it had was like this buzz saw, like a literal buzz saw of teeth in the bottom jaw. Um, and even cooler is that it grew up to 25 feet in length. So that is a 25 foot long buzz saw just swimming around, uh, which was so cool. And I wish they still existed today. That would be great to see. But we are kicking off our weird sharks by going back in time talking about the Helicoprion. And now we are moving forward a little bit. And we are going to be talking a little bit more about modern day sharks. And these evolved between 195 to 25 million years ago. Um, and the six skill shark, which obviously has six skills, great name, um, is the oldest known group of modern sharks. And hammerhead sharks are the most recently evolved living group of sharks. And they branched off about 23 million years ago. So while we're on the topic of very old things, we're gonna focus on the longest living vertebrate on Earth, the uniquely beautiful Greenland shark, which is seen here. Um, it is beautiful. So Greenland sharks can be found swimming very, very slowly, uh, 0.7 miles per hour, actually, in the cold, deep waters of the North Atlantic, hence its name, it can be routinely found around Greenland. Uh, they can grow up to five meters, which is about 15 feet in length, and are possibly the slowest apex predator ever, because you don't have to be fast to utilize ambush hunting or to be a scavenger. Um, they commonly feed on small skates, other sharks, rays, bony fish, but they also prey on seals and have been found with whole reindeer inside of their stomachs, which is very impressive that an animal that swims in the ocean can actually be considered a land apex predator. Uh, and the way this works is that Greenland sharks have been seen kind of hanging out under holes in the ice and they wait for these land animals like reindeer and other large, even seals, um, 
to come take a drink of water and then they grab them and they pull them into the water. So you don't have to be fast when you're smart. And that's how they become such apex predators. Um, so up until 2016, it was basically unknown how long Greenland sharks lived since their backbones were too soft to age. And just a little info drop here, most shark species can be aged by bisecting their vertebrate and counting the deposited rings. So it's just like trees, which is very cool. Um, and in 2016, scientists used a new technique to try to figure out how old these Greenland sharks are. And they used something called radiocarbon dating uh, to measure the carbon isotopes absorbed in the Greenland sharks tissue. So a few things about radiocarbon dating is that it's the measure of C14 or carbon 14 in the shark's eyes. And the reason this works is because the dropping of the atomic bomb and nuclear testing that happened around the end of World War II meant that there were different amounts of carbon-14 in the environment and found in all of our tissues. So the presence of a bomb spike or a high amount of carbon uh, meant that the shark was born before 1960s. And the reason why they focused on the eye lens is because these proteins are really unique and they form when an animal is in the womb and they don't change at all. So they don't degrade and nothing is added to it. So essentially it's like a snapshot of the conditions that were in the natural world when that animal was born. And what they found when they did this is that the tissue gave them a range for the shark's ages and they found that they were at least 272 years old and possibly as old as 512 years old. So now it's important to keep in mind that these are just estimates and there's lots of uncertainty with these estimates, but even the lowest age range of 272 years old makes Greenland sharks the longest living vertebrates known to science. Um, and just a little conservation fact here, it also means that these sharks don't reach sexual maturity until they're about 150 years old. So that is an incredibly long time before these sharks can even start reproducing or repopulating. Um, and just another fact, if you look in the upper right hand corner, there's a picture of a clam. And that is the world's oldest invertebrate species. And that is an ocean clam that was named Ming. Um, and it was named Ming because it was alive for the ruling Ming dynasty in China, which ended in the 1600s. And it was 507 years old. And that seems very, very precise. And that's because while the scientists were trying to figure out how old it was, they killed it by accident. But that's why it was 507 years old and it could have lived to be even longer. But that's just a cool little fact there. And now we're going on to our next shark. So the land shark. And if you don't get the reference to uh, land shark, because some of you might not, I recommend you go and you Google uh, Saturday Night Live skits, uh, the vintage ones, um, and watch the one on land shark because that is a classic. So let's learn a little bit about land sharks. The epaulette shark remains on the reef even when the tide goes out. Of course, with so little water, it doesn't get as much oxygen as it requires normally, but it deals with that possibility by shutting off a part of its brain and so reducing its oxygen demands. As the retreating tide exposes the topmost branches of the corals, the shark remains in the little pools between them for as long as it can. And then it sets off to try and find food. Shrimps, crabs and small worms that live on the reef. And it does that by exploiting another talent it has. It can, in effect, walk. slow going, but the little shark manages to make its way between the rocky pools to look for prey that may be imprisoned in them. How cool is that? 
Um, that is the cutest little shark. And thank you, David Attenborough, for being just a hero to all of us, making the best footage ever. Uh, so let's talk about the Hemicillidae genus of sharks. And these are more commonly called epaulette sharks. And that's because they have those spots on their shoulders. Oh, my hands aren't showing up in the screen. They have these spots on their shoulders, just like on a military uniform where you would have the epaulettes. Um, and there's about nine different species of sharks in this genus. And they use their pectoral and their pelvic fins to move across the ocean floor and to hunt during low tide, which you just saw. So they move very slowly, uh, but they can go quite a distance. And they are able to slow down their heart rate and breathing so they can stay in hypoxic conditions that other marine animals can't. And hypoxic means uh, deprived of oxygen. So clearly these are animals that need to be in water to breathe, but they can actually slow down all of their organs when they're out taking a little stroll looking for snacks. Um, so remember when I said that the hammerhead species were the most recently evolved of modern day sharks and they branched out about 23 million years ago. So scientists recently discovered that these walking sharks uh, with their unique abilities are actually even younger and they split off from their nearest common ancestor about 9 million years ago. Yes, that is still a very long time ago, but what's really, really, really cool about this is that it shows how modern sharks have remarkable evolutionary stages power and they have the ability to adapt to environmental changes which is really important when you think about global warming climate change um, all of the different ways our oceans and our earth is changing recently so if you want to go take a stroll with these cuties uh, you can find them around the reefs of northern australia new guinea indonesia if you do go take a stroll with them please take a video send it to me i would love to see that um, i just think they are adorable and now we're going to talk about something that is not adorable, but is very, very cool. Uh, so somewhere in the deep ocean, there is a tiny little predator that takes on very, very large prey. And it does it with a very unique twist. Um, and it does that by leaving its telltale mark on all sizes and species of marine animals. So this is a tiny animal that is out there feeding on great white sharks, humpback whales, yellowfin tuna, um, that poor gray seal that looks like it was a repetitive snack uh, over and over again. So either it didn't learn its lesson or it was just very slow moving. But what in the world could be leaving such weird bites all over these animals? Hello, cookie cutter shark with the smile that only its mother could love. Um, so meet the cookie cutter shark. So clearly the shark got its name from the cookie shaped wounds that it leaves on the animals um, that it preys on. And it's actually considered a parasite since it can regularly feed on animals without killing them as you could clearly see with that poor gray seal. Um, and what's really cool is that in the 1970s, all these strange holes were found on the rubber parts of a U.S. Navy submarine. And they were really confused about where it came from. And they attributed it to some like mysterious enemy weapon that was being used on them. And then it was later figured out that it was a deep sea shark. And the way it's described in this report, because they didn't know what a cookie cutter shark was, is that it was some kind of deep sea shark that had a watermelon baller for a mouth. Um, and which I think is hilarious because that's exactly what it looks like. But what's really cool is that they were pretty close um, because the cookie cutter shark can take these round chunks out of its prey and it actually has the largest teeth of all shark species relative to its body size, which is very impressive. Um, and another really cool fact about these sharks is that the genus name, which is up there under the cookie cutter shark, um, the genus name is Isistius, and that is in honor of the Egyptian goddess of light, Isis. And this is because the entire lower surface of the cookie cutter shark is bioluminescent. Um, and this is thought to help it attract the attention of prey in the dark parts of the ocean where it lives, where it can then get close enough to take a little cookie bite out of it. Um, so essentially it's down there flashing its lights, a uh, larger animal gets close to see what is going on, and then it takes some little bites out of it. Um, so all in all, cookie cutter shark is a very, very cool shark. It's also known as the cigar shark because it's very small and kind of long and thin like a cigar. 
So moving on from cookie cutter shark, we're going to take a moment to talk about camouflage. So camouflage is basically a superpower for lots of marine creatures and of course for animals on land too. Um, but you can really see it in a cuttlefish, the flounder, the leafy sea dragon, um, and don't forget the mimic octopus too, which is really, really cool one. But there's one shark species that takes camouflage to a completely new level and it does it with the weirdest looking facial hair you've ever seen. So let's take a look at this. The Eastern Seas of Indonesia. The tassels on its chin and intricately camouflaged skin allow this animal to nearly disappear into its surroundings. The wabi looks like a safe place to enter. How cool is that? What a cool animal. So let's all bow down to the master of cryptic coloration, the tasseled wobegong, best facial hair on any animal. So not only does its coloration match the surrounding seafloor where it patiently waits for unsuspecting prey, um, which you can see a little bit more clearly on the right hand side where it's lying um, pretty much prone excuse me, prone on the seafloor, but also is this amazing beard of extended dermal denticles called branched lobes. And dermal denticles are what cover all shark species. Um, they are essentially our skin teeth. So they're not scales, but they're more of a tooth derived kind of skin that all have these little different shapes that help make them a little bit more uh, hydrodynamic. So they have that. So that is what I'm calling the beard area are these branched lobes. Um, and they help it blend right in with the sand and coral. And a lot of that is because it really helps make it hard to differentiate where the shark begins and where the seafloor begins. So that makes it a little bit more um, harder for any of the prey to spot where the wobegong is lying around. And what's really cool is that wobegongs are part of the order of carpet sharks, aptly named because they have a preference of laying on the seafloor bottom, just like your carpet likes to lay on the floor. Um, it's a common misconception that all sharks must keep swimming in a forward direction in order to keep breathing through countercurrent gas exchange, which is actually called ram ventilation. And that's most uh, often seen in like great white sharks, blue sharks, sharks that live in kind of pelagic or open parts of the ocean. All of these carpet sharks and sharks that like to lay on the bottom of the seafloor utilize something called a spiracle, uh, which you can see in the upper left hand corner. And this is kind of a first gill slit that actively pulls in water through muscles called buccal pumps and buccal stands for cheek. Um, and this allows sharks to lay motionless while waiting to ambush prey, just like you saw in the video. Um, so although a lot of carpet sharks utilize ambush hunting, which is basically just laying around until your prey gets close enough to bite it, um, none of them compare to the style of the tasseled wobegong. So that's why I wanted to share the species with you. And it is found in Australia. So again, you can go take a trip over there, hang out with some tasseled wobegongs, go for a walk with the epaulet sharks, lots of very cool weird looking things to see over there. So we're going to switch lanes from very attractive animals to not very attractive animals. I personally find it to be beautiful, but um, it basically, I was told Virginia this, it looks like if you put a sock on your hand and made a sock puppet into a shark and it's known for being super slow um it's described as having a flabby body quote unquote in many scientific papers which is rude um and it's also known for having a very big mouth so let's take a look at this animal right here The krill are calling, and the megamouth navigates straight for the action. At first, I was surprised that we found that shark in such shallow water, but now it makes sense. Every night is the greatest migration on planet, and deep sea animals of all sizes and varieties make their way to the surface as the sun goes away. And the shark was following them up.
The cameras are trained on its huge mouth. And then a ghostly reflection from the diver's lights. An alien glow that may lure prey to their deaths. An unearthly creature finally revealing itself. More than 30 years after it was discovered. Okay, hello, Mega Mouth Shark. I just want to point out that I completely disagree with the pick of music that was used in that clip from Shark Week. Um, it made it seem like the Mega Mouth was something to be scared of, but it's actually a filter feeding shark. So disagree with that. But let's talk about the Mega Mouth Shark. So this wonderfully weird shark was first discovered in 1976 by a US Navy research vessel in Hawaii. And what happened is that the poor Mega Mouth Shark got caught in all of these cables around the boat and they then transferred it to the National Marine Fishery Service where it was officially discovered that this shark had never been seen before. So no one knew about the shark until 1976, which is pretty recent. Um, and the scientific name Megachasma pelagios translates into Latin for mega, which is huge, gaping, which is chasma, of the sea pelagios. So essentially huge gaping or huge cave of the sea. So what a great name. Um, and since this first sighting, it's only been seen about a hundred times um, around the world, which you can see in the map in the middle. And strangely enough, um, a lot more females have been sighted instead of male sharks. Um, most of the sightings for it have been in Taiwan, Japan, and the Philippines. And this is because they are some of the only countries that really do deep, deep, deep water trawling. It, excuse me, and when they do something like that, they can bring up all of these animals that were down in the deep water. That's why they frequently catch mega mouth sharks, um, goblin sharks, all of that kind of stuff. And although it has a huge mega cave mouth, like I said, it's one of the only known, um, one of, sorry, one of only three only known plankton feeding sharks. So that also includes basking shark and whale shark. And it copies the same feeding method seen in baleen whales, and that's called engulfment feeding. And this is the only shark species that does this. And you can see um, a little drawing of this to the right hand side, which isn't very informative, but I included it because I thought it was one of the funniest drawings I've ever seen in a scientific paper. Um, it is the sock mouth, uh, sock puppet drawing. But basically the engulfment feeding is you take a big suck in of water and krill, close your mouth and push out all of the water that you don't want in your body out of your gill slits and all the krill and plankton stays in your mouth. So mega mouse spend the daytime in deep waters, which you just saw in the video, but then at night they undergo dial vertical migration. So they head to shallower water to eat krill um, and other plankton. And the reason I mentioned that it might glow is that it's thought that the gums of these sharks are possibly bioluminescent, um, which in the deep dark parts of the ocean, that means that the shark could swim around with its mouth open and other animals would kind of be attracted to it and just swim into its mouth, making its job very easy. Um, so kind of like a moth to a light or people to a disco ball. Um, so since they can grow to almost six meters long, which is about 18 to 19, 20 feet, just think of this weird shark as like some awesome slow moving party bus um, that just kind of swims through the deep dark parts of the ocean, but then comes up to shallower water um, at nighttime. So I saved the, what I think is the coolest looking shark uh, for last. And you're welcome for this because it is a great way to end the talk. And let's take a look at what shark I'm talking about. Here in the middle layer of the ocean, slithers one of the shark world's most unusual species, the frilled shark. The frilled shark is one of the most bizarre looking creatures on the planet. It really does look like an alien. 
It's possible some of the myths and legends of sea serpents came from the frilled shark. Behind its grin is a mouth like nothing researchers have ever seen. Row after row of razor sharp hooked teeth, 25 rows, 300 teeth. Their victims don't stand a chance. They can distend their mouths open and eat things that are more than half their body length. And then its digestive system also expands, like kind of like a snake, so that it can take in a really big piece of prey and then slowly digest it down its track. OK, how cool is that? I just love how happy that the frilled shark looks when it's swimming around. It's got that little grin on its face. And the reason why it's swimming around with its mouth open is because it's doing the ram ventilation that we talked about. So the water's going into its mouth and out its gill slits, and it's getting oxygen that way. Um, I prefer to think that it's just swimming around really happy and excited. But the frilled shark uh, is called a living fossil. And it's not because it just looks really, really weird. But that is actually a little bit of the reason. It's because it retains a lot of the unusual kind of primitive features that shark relatives um, had millions and millions of years ago in the Clododont group. Um, and that is referring to a group of ancient sharks with a very unique tooth structure. So it lives in very deep waters between 400 and 5,000 feet deep and is rarely spotted by humans. Um, so some cryptozoologists believe that the frilled shark may be responsible for people believing that sea serpents existed, which they said in the video. Um, and that's kind of explains why sea serpents are seen in folklore and other stuff like that, which is really cool. Now it also explains why its Latin name means snaky mm -hmm. or consisting mm -hmm. of snakes mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. in Guia. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I don't know what that sound is. Um, so, woof, what are we talking about? Oh, so what you saw in the video is that it has all of those very red frilled gill slits, and that's how it got its name, kind of the fluffy appearance of the gill slits. And then besides the cookie cutter shark, it has the most unique tooth and jaw structure um, of any shark species. And it has over 300 trident shaped teeth which you can see in the right hand corner Jackson. Whoa, hello which are arranged in rows of 25 and they face the back of the mouth just like a, a moray eel and some snake species so the majority of the prey are deep sea squid or other bony fish that are very slippery and that explains why its teeth are essentially shaped like forks because every time the frilled shark a bite of something it keeps the slippery animal, the squid or the bony fish stuck in place. And anytime that animal tries to swim forward and out of its mouth, it actually gets more stuck in the frilled shark's mouth. Um, so the first observation of these species in the natural habitat didn't actually come until August 2004. And it was made by a NOAA deep sea remote operating vehicle or ROV. And footage from that ROV is actually seen on the left hand side of the screen um, you Mom, can like, camera the still, and you can see that the shark was seen at 2,800 feet deep underwater so very very deep um, and that also explains why it's really rarely seen by humans. Um, there are actually a few really cool YouTube videos of some lucky people in Japan who actually saw a frilled shark um, it was caught in a deep sea net and it was brought up to the surface still alive. And so there's actually footage of them snorkeling or diving with it. I'm not quite sure which one, but you can see how it swims and it swims in a very unique manner that's unlike kind of any of the other shark species. So I recommend that you look that up on YouTube. It's very cool to see. Um, and it's also cool because you're just very unlikely to ever see these sharks anywhere in real life. Uh, so take a minute, check that out. And that is the frilled shark. So that's kind of it for our brief introduction to the world of uh, weird and wonderful sharks. Um, there are many, many, many more species that I could have highlighted today, but I don't think anyone except myself wanted to sit around for like a 10 day lecture 
on how strangely awesome every single individual shark species is. But what's really cool is that you can learn more about different shark species on the Thursday talk. Um, and hopefully you guys picked up some new shark facts that you can dazzle friends and family with. Um, and also just learned about some sharks that really are kind of rarely highlighted or seen on on Shark Week or in any of those other sharky shows on Discovery Channel, uh, National Geographic, all of that kind of stuff. So I think it is question time. I didn't see any questions in the chat that I missed. Um, I don't think I did. Virginia, you have to let me know. No, I didn't see any come through either, but this is a great time. You can ask about sharks that Lindsay talked about or maybe other favorite sharks that yeah. you have lingering questions about. <laughs> Are there any questions? <laughs> Looks like Megan's brother would want to listen to it. Oh my gosh, show. okay. <laughs> then I will totally make a Sunday lecture. Um, I'm glad because there are like 500 species of shark and every single one is amazing and we should learn about every single one. So I'm very glad that um, I at least would have an audience of two other people besides my dog who would want to hear me listen uh, talk about that. <laughs> Which one's your favorite weird shark? I think my favorite weird shark is um, is the mega mouth. Um, I think it just is it looks like some, this is very inarticulate, but it looks like an animal species that has just never been seen before. Um, I love how simple it looks. It looks like my two-year-old niece drew what she thought a shark was, and then someone made it into a real animal. Um, and I think they're just so cute and they're so large. So I love how they are basically harmless to humans and that you can really um, dive and get close to them. There is some really cool footage that came up, I think just last fall. Um, it wasn't on YouTube though, it was on Facebook, but it was a bunch of divers in Japan that actually came up upon a mega mouth shark swimming and they got beautiful footage of it. Um, I didn't really have a way of sharing it, um, unfortunately, so I couldn't include it, but you should definitely go out and uh, look for that footage because it's just really, really cool to see this animal kind of lumbering about underwater. Um, let's see, is there a video of frilled sharks with large food in their bellies? So the thing is, is that there actually isn't like any footage of a frilled shark. They're so rarely seen. Um, so there might be some out there, but this footage was taken from an episode of Alien Sharks on Shark Week, one of, um, one of my favorite shows that they do on Shark Week because they do focus on these other shark species and they also highlight actual shark scientists um, that focus on these deep water sharks. So I think your best bet to see if there was any footage of food in its stomach would be to go back and check out any Alien Shark episodes. They usually do one every year. Um, but I haven't seen any at all. Um, let's see. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. Hi, Claire. Sharks do bite humans. So I'm always very hesitant to include any information about uh, shark attacks, clearly, um, because it's so rare. Um, but I thought it was, I mean, I was so close to including an image of it because it's not gross at all. It just kind of looked like that gray seal with those little circular cuts because um, it, it was completely healed over. But there's been like four or five actually instances worldwide in the last 100 years of people having um, being bit by cookie cutter sharks. And I think it's just so strange <laughs> to think of how rarely these animals come up to the surface and that it just purely by chance coincided with when there was a human there and they were like the cookie cutter shark was like I don't know what you are but you're kind of large like a seal so I'm just going to take a little bite out of you um, 
very, very rare, but it has happened. Um, but a lot of the studies of um, instances of where there have been cookie cutter sharks um, taken by some humans actually happened when people would go back and look at um, deaths that happened when people drowned from like boat sinking and stuff like that. So they would go back and they would see um, you know, kind of what animals have been feasting and they saw that cookie cutter sharks were one of those species of fish that was actually feasting on people who would drown. Um, let's see, oh, breathing techniques. So those are basically it. Um, the breathing techniques used by sharks are pretty basic. There's two, um, there's basically stop and go. Um, and the go is ram ventilation. So those are the shark species that have to swim in a forward direction. Those are sharks that just aren't really close to the seafloor bottom, uh, like great whites, um, basically any shark that doesn't live by a coral reef. And then sharks that live around coral reefs, so nurse sharks, wobegongs, angel sharks, um, white tip reef sharks. These are the kind of animals that are actually close to the bottom of a seafloor, whether it's in shallow water or deep water. And those are the ones that really rely on their spiracles. Um, and what's really cool with white tip reef sharks, because I know a lot of you guys are big divers, um, is that if you go around in some Caribbean or tropical waters while diving with a flashlight and you kind of shine it into a cave area, you're likely to see this like really adorable cuddle pile of white tip reef sharks because they sleep during the day all piled on top of one another like little kittens and it's so cute and that's actually to help them be hyper aware of if there's any predators close by because the first one to alert that there's a predator close by will wake up all the other ones but it is so cute so that's you know besides ambush hunting they also use it for sleeping like that any oh so nurse sharks yeah yeah so nurse sharks use um you know they're not great ambush predators they're because they're pretty slow um i love nurse sharks by the way but they do utilize spiracles and a lot of that is for when they're not moving so it's kind of unsure about how sharks sleep, but they think it happens that basically half the brain is turned off and that's kind of the one that controls uh, like cognitive abilities while the other half stays awake and that's the one that keeps it breathing. Um, so for carpet sharks, they breathe on the seafloor bottom and they rest. Um, other sharks like a great white shark goes down into deep water 